I, I can't wait to get to the tasting of the wines, of course. But before we do that, let's begin at the very beginning. Give us a chronology of, of how the, the thing first begins as a grape or however it, and, it, it and carries. It is handled differently in different parts of the world. There is a certain order in which wine should be drunk. We will drink them in that order, and I'll take the wines in that order and give you some background as to the areas. Okay. Uh, you start with light and go to heavy, dry and go to sweet, young and go to old. Uh, in a formal dinner, you might serve ten wines. Really? Oh, yeah. I went to one Thursday night. It was beautiful. Ten different wines? We had seventeen. Seven. Now, that's a far-out example. This is a group of professional tasters. And Just out of curiosity. All built around food, though. Can you remember the main course? Yeah. It was a, a little veal, uh, lamb cutlets with beautiful garniture of vegetables and ah. all the goodies go around. It was done well. This particular bottle in front of us, the largest bottle mm -hmm. that you have, tell us the chronology of that. Well, let's start at this okay. and, and go to that. Fine. The first wine we're going to taste is a German wine. Uh, it's an ice cube that was... Dropped an ice cube in the wrong spot. Uh, Germany probably produces the finest wines made in the world. Germany. And the, the least understood, and with a little patience, the easiest to understand. Their labels are completely explanatory. They tell you everything that is there is to know about that wine and leave nothing to your imagination. Where no other wine does that. For example. Okay. This will give you a quick way to tell the, the origin of wine. The shape of the bottle and the color of the bottle. German wines are in all in long, thin bottles, except the wines uh, in the box bottle, the little Stein wines. We all don't often see those in this country. Right. If it's a green bottle, it's always from the Moselle Valley. Never varies. The Moselle Valley right. is green. That's up north. If it's a brown bottle, it's a Rhine wine. So you can, from across the room, be somewhat of a wine expert. You know what part of Germany the wine came from. Uh, in the other part of the world that makes fine wine, France, all Bordeaux wines, red or white, are long, straight-sided bottles. You're looking at one right here. Uh -huh. All Burgundies, white or red, are fatter, and have a, a shoulder. The bottle itself has the bottle shoulder. has a slight shoulder coming out, and it's a stockier bottle, mm -hmm. white or red. Right. And the same with the Bordeaux, white or red, always a straight-sided bottle. Right. Okay, now we're going to open uh, a wine called Schwarzhofberger. Most German wine labels will give you the district and the vineyard. This particular wine is so famous that they forgot the town. It's just Schwarzhofberger, made by one man, Egon Mueller. I think he's probably the finest grower of wines in all of Germany, and most people will agree. Egan Mueller. Mueller. His family has owned this vineyard probably for hundreds of years. Huh. And the German government allows him to just put his name. It's like you putting your name on something and saying that everybody's supposed to know And what everyone it is. around the world knows that's the whole his, world. his bottle. Uh, Germany's the only country in the world that doesn't equalize wine. The harvest period might last five weeks. Five longer weeks would produce a richer, fuller wine. In France and most wine-producing countries of the world, at the end of the harvest period, where they have thousands of gallons of wine, they equalize them. They mm -hmm. mix them all up in vats. So the stuff that was picked the first day of the harvest season is mixed with the same wine that was picked on the fifth week. I see. And they get a uniform quality. So every bottle of Lafitte Rothschild tastes the same. In Germany, they separate every day's picking. And they let you know when it was picked, how it was made, uh, even like December 6th, I think, is St. Nicholas Day in Germany. If the wine is picked on St. Nicholas Day, it'll send the label, St. Nicholas Day wine. And they have, all through this time of the Christmas season, they have all kinds of uh, religious holidays. And they'll put that right on the label. If they don't go that far, they'll let you know at the time, uh, the time the wine was picked by certain phrases such as, well, the first wine picked during the, the growing, the harvesting period would be a Natura wine a natural wine, the driest wine that this vin this winemaker would make. The sugar is lowest at that point. At the first day of picking. First day of picking. As the, gr the picking season progresses, the next wine picked, he'll call Spätlese. Spät means late. A late picked wine. Since it's been on the vine a little longer, it's richer, a little fuller. I see. Uh, he goes through the fields again, and he picks his Oschlese. These are select bunches of grapes, overripe grapes, or even starting to dry up a little bit. Then he classifies his Oschlese into three subcategories. He has his regular Oschlese, his Feine Oschlese, his Feinste Oschlese, and his Hackfeinste, the best of the best. Huh. Now, 
you have to trust the integrity of the grower. There are no laws that regulate what he calls his wine, but these men are of impeccable reputation. And he answers to his fellow wine growers. And uh, between an Oschlesa and a Feinsta Oschlesa, you can find a uh, 100% increase in price, and justified. I would assume uh, that the integrity of the wine man must be pretty high. Or in else this part of the world, it's, uh, there's nothing like it anywhere else in the world. I see. They'll throw them in jail. They have certain regulations, and they'll put them out of business. They've done it. No scandals in wine, like in Italy, where they're making wine without seeing a grape. They wouldn't do that here. <laughs> Uh, but he's not through with his Oschlesa. Then he has his barren Oschlesa. These are overripe grapes that are actually starting to dry up. They're becoming raisins. These are very sweet hmm. and uh, magnificent wines, and most of us never even see them. Hmm. But he's not through there. And if, if the gods have been kind, he makes what they call a trocken barren Oschlesa. These are individual berries picked with tweezers. With uh, tweezers. They have been attacked by a mold. The mold is called edelfoil, the noble mold. The mold dissolves the skin of the grape and allows the water to evaporate. All you have left is essence of grape juice, like a honey. It starts to dry up and actually looks like a raisin. Looks very unappetizing. Can you imagine squeezing juice out of a raisin? It takes one man a full day to pick enough grapes to make one bottle. Wow. Now. These are probably the rarest and most expensive white wines in the world. What are they called? What are some of the names? Uh, any, this man makes them. Uh, Schwarzhofberger would just say Trockenbeeren Oschlese. That's his Trockenbeeren Oschlese. German uh. viniculture can be traced back hundreds of years. In certain parts of Germany, this wine has only pr been produced once or maybe twice in hundreds of years. Shall we get on with the... Uh, okay, but he goes one step further in oh, Germany. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, he, he has told you now how he selects and keeps working his, his vineyards over and picking individual and, and select bunches of grapes. Then he separates casks. The wines picked today must go in one cask. The wines picked tomorrow must go in another cask. Hmm. Those casks are numbered. And in, one, in the Mosel, they're called fooders, and in the Rhine, they're called fosses. Every so often, he'll even go so far as to say, this is my best cast. And a big neck strip right along the top of the bottle will say, bestest foss, my best cask that I made all year, Whew. and those are very, very expensive. And again, it's up to the, uh, the wine grower to say, this is my best. No one regulates him, but if he says it, it is true. The wine we're going to drink now is a Schwarzhofberger Spätlese. This is the second picking. It's a little late, slightly sweet. Uh, fooder number 31, so it's from a specific cast. They don't always put fooder numbers on. One day, he may pick an awful lot of wine. He may fill up three casks from one day's picking. How much wine fits in a wine cask? Is it a regulated size? I'm not sure about Germany. I know France is uh, 24 cases to a barrel. 24? In Bordeaux. Yeah. And how many bottles to a case? 12. 12 big ones, 24 small ones, 6 magnums. So it would be to about 260 bottles of wine out of every cask. Uh, yes. And what is the, is the cask outside of a, 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 a barrel? I mean, There's a lot of tradition there. Uh, France uses uh, certain types of wood. Uh, cognac uses another. Usually it's from the forest that the joins, or it traditionally ah. did, the, the wine growing area because it would be convenient. Um, some of them use new casks. Some firms use old casks, depending on what they're making. Uh, Scotch whiskey is aged in old sherry casks. So they bring casks all the way from Spain to Scotland to age whiskey. Feel Scotch is aged in, in sherry. In sherry casks. Old, used sherry casks. Where was this bottle aged? In what kind of a cask? Do you I'm not sure of the type of wood. Uh, I've seen them. I think they hold more than 24 cases. They're tremendous barrels. Hmm. I can imagine. Rather uh, uh, elaborately carved. They're beautiful. Whew. And uh, I don't know where they would. I know that uh, oak is used in Bordeaux. I think it's used in Burgundy, too. Are you going to open that right now? Right now. Ah. Not that I'm impatient. Now, this type of wine should not be served too cold because what you're paying for it with a wine of this quality is a beautiful, delicate bouquet. And if you get it too cold, it'll stifle it. So the best thing to do is what you saw me do. I get it as cold as it'll get. And then I removed it from the ice a little while ago, held it in my hand, or you can set it on the table 20 minutes before you serve it, and it'll come back down to the proper temperature. In other words, it comes down to the proper temperature just by holding it? Just by it. setting it on the table in, in, a, in a, a room that we would be occupying. Uh, 
but if you try to put it in a refrigerator and bring it to the proper temperature, it's almost impossible. So I just get it good and cold and remove it shortly before I'm going to drink it. I want to watch you do that very slowly, uh, taking the cork okay. out. Let's go start at the beginning. Yes. All fine wine has uh, a capsule, usually lead, near the top of the bottle. Some of them get very elaborate and ornate. Right. Uh, some people just tear them off. I think that looks awful because I think it's kind of attractive. There's a little lip about a quarter of an inch down from the top of the bottle. I take a sharp knife and neatly cut that. Roy just did that. He just removed the top of the, uh, oh, leaving the rest. He says I have a thing for neatness with that. It looks, looks very nice, I think. I don't like the foil to come in contact with the wine. I think it might affect the taste. This is clean. If this were an older Bordeaux, there would be some mold on the cork. And I would take a towel and just wipe off the wipe top the mold. before I pull the cork. After this is after I remove the capsule. Uh, the old waiter's type corkscrew, I think, is the best. I think most of you know what I... This is the, just the very simple metal very thing you buy for a dollar or something. And uh, you take the point of the corkscrew and stick it in the cork, and then just start turning, and it'll go in. And it's gone right into the center. And then you fold this part of it down over the lip, and then this gives you a lever. That's it. Uh, how come every time I do that at home, half the cork remains in the bottle, and I have to get the strainer out? It does with me, too, sometimes. Uh, I'll tell you what really causes that. <laughs> Uh, it won't happen with this kind of a wine, but it does happen to people. Uh, Germany doesn't use long corks, but Bordeaux, this bottle we're going to open soon, has a very long cork. And as you're pulling it out, if you don't go straight up and parallel to the sides of the bottle, it'll break. So the key is to pull it straight out. Straight out. Not and uh, using this type of a cork where you've got the leverage, there's a natural bend as you pull the cork up. So you use the lever only so far and then pull straight up yourself. The cork's almost always out then. I see. I a see. very, very old bottle of wine can crumble, and there's no, nothing you can do about that. You strain it or try to fish the cork out or that's drink true. with cork in your glass. If you have an, a bottle of wine that's 100 years old, I would assume that the cork could just immediately disintegrate, couldn't it? It, it does. Uh, classically, uh, the fine restaurants of France and the chateaus themselves in their libraries of wine recork about every 25 years. Oh, let me huh. show you something else. All great wine of the world is cork branded. This is to protect you. Somebody could take this label off. Say this were leapfrog milch and put a Schwarz Hofburger label on it and get a lot of money for it. So the grower, to protect his clients, cork brands his wine. And it'll have the vintage year, the name of his estate, and his own name. All of that's on the cork? On the cork. Let me see that. Is that on, on every fine bottle of wine? The only exception might be Burgundy, if you get it from a very small grower who doesn't have the facilities to do that. Other than that, all Bordeaux wine is cork branded. Here it says Abzuk, sir. It says the original Abflung, which means he has bottled it at his own estate. And it's by law, that means there can be no sugar added to this wine. Great. It must be pure. Well, now we'll have this. Uh, pour, uh, pour that in front of the microphone. This is a... Okay. I've been waiting for this. You're not the only one. Now, first of all... You're holding the glass wrong. Uh oh. Right. Describe the these glasses. For that. There's more to it than just an aff affectation. This wine has a beautiful color. Hold it up to the light. Let me turn the light. It has a golden color with a slight green tinge. It does. It really if is. If you beautiful. held the wine by the bowl, first of all, you couldn't see through your fingers. Secondly, by the end of the evening, your glass would be full of sticky finger marks, which aren't attractive. This way, you have a perfectly crystal clear look at beautiful wine. So the idea is to always hold it by, by the, the stem. stem. Right. And uh, swirl it slightly. As the wine goes up the sides of the glass and down, some evaporates and comes up as a chimney through the top of the, the, the glass. Also, you're bringing air into it. Now stick your nose into it. Uh, let me just ask you about that. As uh, Just twirling it mm -hmm. inside the glass. You're like throwing air up through it. And as it goes up the sides of the glass and then down, there is some evaporation. And this will throw the bouquet up through the top. What you pay for it, with this type of wine is this bouquet. They are the most delicate and beautiful wines made in the world. Huh. Now stick your nose in the glass. Literally stick the nose right in. Right in it. Except not into the wine, you'll drown. Ah, it smells lovely. You can tell a lot about wine by its color. This is young. See the vintage. 69 vintage. Oh, sh should. And by uh, the way, what would be the best way to taste it, the first taste of the wine? Is there a, a particular uh, a wine? A professional ta taster doesn't swallow for one. Oh, well, we'll he have none of that so here. That. No. Uh, put it in your mouth and suck air through it. What do you mean, suck air through it? 
something like that. Do that again. Let me see. But you, you got to be careful. It's going to come right up through your nose. <laughs> I, I can't imagine what you just did. You I the, sucked air, but I, it, it's difficult to do without it having coming back up around. I bet it just taste it first before doing that. Throw it into the back of your mouth. Just a second. You don't, to, you don't swallow it as soon as you put it in your mouth. Oh, it's delicious. It's all natural sugar. It's beautiful. This type of wine in Germany isn't always drunk with food. This is at a, served at a picnic or sitting around the patio on a warm summer afternoon. Uh, they usually drink beer with food in Germany. The English are big users of this type of wine. But uh, we serve these in place of a cocktail for dinner party. Just sitting out in the patio on a day like today, I would open a bottle like this and drink it without food. It's very refreshing. It's, it's really delicious. What is this called again, just for the benefit of it's, people? Uh, it's uh, uh, from the Saar. Back to why it tastes like it does. Germany uses many different grapes to make wine. The king of the grapes is the Riesling, a tiny grape, extremely difficult to grow. It likes a, an unlikely place to grow. It likes steep hillsides, slate. The hillsides are so steep they must be terraced, all hand labor. They can't get equipment up to work these vineyards. Other parts of Germany use the other grapes like the Sylvaner, which mm -hmm. make large quantities of wine, but they don't have quite the quality this wine has. And if you look at a map of the world and look where these vineyards are, they're the most, most northerly vineyards in the whole world. So you have very little sunshine, which grapes need, a very short summer, and cold weather. So everything is against this man making wine of this quality. Ah. So they're, they're works of art. My name is Elliot Mintz, and I'll be with you until midnight. My guest here for the first segment of our program is Roy Caven, who is an absolute expert in the field of wine. We are tasting wine, drinking wine. May I have just a little bit more of that uh, that particular bottle? You can't say that. You must say Schwarz Hofberger Spätlese 1969. May I have some of the Schwarzberger Spätlese 1969? Hmm. It's just... Lovely one. Now, you were about to open yet another bottle. This is a Bordeaux. Uh, Bordeaux is probably the largest fine wine producing area in the world. They make lots of wine, all different qualities. They use basically the same grapes, Cabernet, which does well in California. Some of the chateaus, there they're called chateaus, and in Germany they're called estates or castles. Uh, and it may not really be a chateau, maybe a little shed, but it's where they make their wine. I see. Uh, they use the Cabernet grape, which does its best here, and it's probably the best wine California produces. Uh, what is the essential difference between a white wine and a red wine outside of the color? They make white wine with red grapes. The, skin, the color comes from the skins. Champagne is made with a black grape. White wine is made mm -hmm. with red grapes? If they remove the skins... They get a white wine. The juice is white. All juice of all wines are white. Check next time you bite into a black grape. Right. Huh. And the color comes from the skins. And the, the longer they leave the skins in contact with the juice they have picked, the darker, the richer the wine gets. Also, most of the acid. This wine we're going to take now is a very, very long-lived wine. Probably the longest-lived of all the fine red wines in the world. Uh, Bordeaux can live up to 100 years. And what keeps them alive and gives them the staying power is tannic acid. Tannic? And that's what you're going to taste in this wine. And that comes from the skins, the skins and the pips and the things that hold the grapes together. And they carefully measure how long they allow these to stay in contact with the wine. Too much, it makes just a wine that would pucker you up <laughs> and live in, live forever. So they have to, to gauge this very carefully. In, in conventional alcohol like scotch and uh, vodka and, and the rest of it, to mix uh, liquors or liqueurs w uh, is injurious to one's health. I mean, it will make you sick or nauseous. It, it won't hurt your health. It'll make you feel bad. I mean, you're going you're gonna to live. And you're not going to yes. probably suffer any ill effects. It, uh, the combination, just like eating uh, a steak, uh, top it off with a, a lobster. ice cream, or yeah. it's even more ludicrous, uh, it would make you sick. I think there's no reason to mix too many drinks. There's no reason for With that. wines, does one encounter the same problem, or can one mix wines One easy? can mix them beautifully. There's no problem. Uh, the problem might arise if you had a martini before dinner and then went into wines. You, w you might feel it more readily. Um, but you can sit down and drink, through the course of an evening, five different, six different wines, hmm. and 
the quantity of liquor could affect you depending on your own capacity. But the mixing of the wines would have no effect whatsoever. Uh, does all wine contain 13% alcohol? No. This is another point about the Schwarz Hofburger. The lowest alcoholic content of any fine wines produced are the Mosels, about 10%. And the highest? Would be the fortified wines like the Sherry's and the Ports, and most of the wines like this Bordeaux and the Burgundies would be have around 13%, I think. So this it would... Is 11. Between 10 and 13 would be... Fair. Right, but the... Mosels go way down. This also doesn't give them staying power. Alcohol will keep it alive. They're delicate wines. They don't, you don't buy a wine like Schwarz Hofburg and plan on keeping it for your 20th anniversary. Or this Bordeaux, you could. It is the alcoholic, the, the quantity of alcohol in a drink that gets you drunk, isn't yes. it? Therefore, uh, somebody, people who claim that they get uh, stoned off of two or three glasses of wines, are they just... No, it could be. They have a, a low tolerance to it. But two or three glasses of wine would be less than the equivalent of a straight shot of yes. vodka. Uh, certain people are susceptible to the acid in wine, uh, especially something like this Bordeaux. I know people say that it upsets their stomach, and I think it might be possible. I've heard it from so many people. It doesn't bother me. Shall we taste it? Uh, sure. Yes. Now, uh, pour that in front of us so we can share some of this, if, le if at least not the taste, the sound with our friends. Now, when you pour wine, it's best to tilt the glass and pour down the side. You don't want it splashing. That's bad for the wine. She you poured a lot that time. It's a big glass. Now, this wine really should have been opened about two hours ago. Thank you, Ryan. And, and allowed it, especially since it's so young. It's a 1966 Chateau Giscourt, which is from the area of Margot. Bordeaux is a big area, and it, it's like saying you're having a bottle of California wine sitting somewhere in Timbuktu. It can mean a lot of things. Most people associate Bordeaux with Lafitte Rothschild and wines like that. Well, that's just from one area. Bordeaux is divided into different areas. The most common, I would imagine, is the Madoc. But there are subclassifications of the Madoc. There's Pauillac, Margot, Saint Estef. St. Julian. What are those? Are those They're little villages. They're Each little of villages. these villages has chateaus. So the wine label would say, like this one does, Chateau Giscourt, Grand Cru, and it's from the area of Margot. A Lafitte Rothschild would say, uh, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, Grand Cru, Pauillac. Each of these areas, areas has a taste characteristic, and they can be spotted. By the end of this evening, you'll be able to smell the difference between Bordeaux and Burgundy. Just by smell alone. Absolutely. Sure. Let me take a whiff of this. Uh, this okay, is now first, Burgundy. swirl a glass, because this wine really needs it. This is a wine that will live a long time, and it's very young, and the bottle is just opened. I've swirled it, and I've also held it up to the light, and this, too, has um, that beautiful... What you can tell about this wine from the color is that it's young. It has a, a purplish look to it. As this wine gets older, it'll get softer in color, and when it gets too old, as you swirl it and the wine comes down from the size of the glass, it'll have an orange cast. You can tell if a wine's too old by just looking at it. Fascinating. Also, the smell, the bouquet, the perfume, will tell you a lot about the age of the wine and its characteristics. Now, 1966 was a very good year. We were just about to drink some Burgundy. Right. We'll finish with the Bordeaux first. Oh, the Bordeaux, that's right. right. Yes. Uh, we discovered, discussed the Medoc, which is the primary wine-producing area of Bordeaux, and the the area, the subclassifications of Pauillac, Saint Julien, Saint uh, Steph, and Margot. The other areas within the Bordeaux region are Saint Emilion, which we call heard of, Pomerol, Graves, mm -hmm. and Sauternes and Barsac, which primarily make white wine. I see. Sweet dessert white wine. Uh, Roy, a couple of questions as, as I'm drinking this, and this is truly a delicious wine. Um, most people think that you, you drink red wine with meat, white wine with fish. Is that correct or silly? These are rules that have been laid down, and to my taste, they do apply. But I, I think you should drink what you want with whatever you want. I see. Actually, the thing that brings out the flavor in uh, red wine more than anything else would be cheese. And at cheese? A, at a formal dinner party, say you were having pheasant as a, an entree, you would not serve your best wine of the evening with the pheasant. You would serve it following the pheasant with the cheese course. Huh. And what would you serve with the pheasant? A good wine. You'd be building up throughout the dinner. Uh, There's a progression. And you're working towards better and bigger wines, but your biggest and uh, most dynamic wine of the evening would be served with your cheese course. Are any wines natural aphrodisiacs? Or are certain wines more... Again, as with what you're going to eat what with. Uh, <laughs> Just watch that. Yeah. Uh, 
If you think it does, great. In other words, but, but There's realistic. There's no reason for it, just like booze. If, if anything, from what my doctor tells me, it would have the opposite effect. That it alcohol makes you think you're Superman, but you're really not. And, and, and what is it? That's effect? alcohol in general. Uh, it doesn't do the job. It would have the, the opposite effect. And on women, the same in terms of their sexual response? I think so. Yeah. Uh, no, they can give a... Uh, it's a cop-out. I was so drunk, I didn't know what I was doing. I so, remember hearing that. Okay, so other than that, uh, don't count on it. Enjoy it with your dinner. Do you have to spend a lot of money to uh, have fine wines? For instance, I, I can't imagine what your weekly budget would be, but uh, the average person, if they wanted to have a, a, a bottle of wine with each meal, what would the, the budget for a week well, be? You started to say something that brings up a good point. You can't have a glass of one of these wines to spoil. Air will kill any wine we're not drinking. So if you open one of these bottles, you have to drink it. Uh, you could recork it, and if it isn't too old, a uh, wine like the 66 years ago, it would probably hold up till the next day. Uh, if it were 20 years from now and uh, this wine had developed some maturity, it wouldn't. The only way you can save these wines is to pour them into a smaller container so there's no airspace. Ah. If you can pop this bottle, and the 12 ounce medicine bottle, this bottle is 24 ounces, pour the other half into the medicine bottle, screw the lid up, leave right. no airspace, and the wine will keep falling indefinitely. But if you huh. drink half of it and leave it in the original container, it'll turn to vinegar in a day or two. It would turn to vinegar? It would be a shame. Like a I didn't know. It. Wine uh, naturally turns to yes, vinegar? Yes, wine vinegar. For heavens. Right. So you brought up a good point there. Insofar as spending money in drinking fine wines, the ideal answer is a wine cellar. The problem with this type of wine, we're talking about premium wines, is they're released and they're relatively inexpensive, but they're not ready to be drunk. It's sort of criminal to drink the wine. It, it tastes beautiful, but I know what it'll be like in 20 years, and it's a shame to drink it now. In 20 years, that wine could be worth 50, 60, 70 dollars a bottle. Possibly, we don't know. I see. Who's going to spend that? Now, if you bought it uh, two years ago when it was released and paid two dollars for it, and 20 years from today you may see it selling for 60, but you know you only pay two on some special occasion to get a lot of pleasure out of that wine. So the, the right way to drink wine is set up a budget. Five dollars a month is my wine budget. Five dollars a month? Saying oh, 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 yeah. It could be a thousand a month for some you know, Depending on what you think you can afford. You and work within budget. that. Don't buy wine every month, though, because you may find nothing to buy. You don't walk out and buy wine like you would uh, most of the things we buy, like a bunch of uh, bananas. They're not always available. These are natural products. I am in the business, and if you ask me for certain wines today, I may not be able to supply you. Tell me th this, Roy. Uh, something just occurred to me. I have just switched from the um, the red wine back to the white wine, mm -hmm. and uh, now the white wine tastes even more delicious than it did ten minutes ago. It should. Uh, Why? But, uh, yes, but as you go back to the red wine, the red wine's going to taste harder than it should, because this wine has a slight. We should really. I meant to bring some, and I set it aside, but forgot. Brought some cheese to clear the palate between these two wines. This wine has a little sweetness to it. And as you go from this, especially to a wine as young and as tannic as this, it may accentuate the tartness and may make it taste a little unpleasant. This brings about, you no know, wine and food. Vinegar is bad for wine. Sugar, you can't mix them because it makes it brings out the worst in the wine. You try to eat a candy bar and have a glass of uh, wine as tannic as the chef that just goes, it tastes horrible. Can you use wine as a salad dressing? I don't think so. I don't think it tastes too good. How would you use wine in preparing fish, for instance? When you use wine in cooking, the alcohol leaves the wine, you cook it out, you reduce it. You ever, that I can think of in my cooking, ever abuse the wine as it is, except possibly in a soup you might add a drop or two of sherry or a drop or two of some wine to finish a sauce. But when you're using it in cooking, it's always reduced. Normally, if you glaze a pan, you will roast something or saute something. And then after you do this, there's a crust in the bottom of the pan. Uh, you add the wine at that point and scrape that crust up. There's a lot of flavor in it. And then you reduce the wine maybe by two thirds, so just the essence of the wine is left. Then if you thicken that slightly and add some garniture, you have a magnificent sauce, be it for fish or meat. Ah, oh, all right. Uh, you, you were, Roy is opening up yet another bottle of... Did I pick in the wrong name? Ah, uh, there. I just pushed the wrong button. The wine is beginning to have a very positive effect upon me. It's healthy.
<laughs> you have opened up now a third bottle of, of wine. This bottle is, is my true love in wine, Burgundy, ah. for many reasons. I think it's probably the most beautiful part of France. It's the food belt of France. Everything that is good to eat, almost everything, is raised in and around Burgundy. I've been there. Back in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, and green rolling hills. Right. And right. sheep and soft uh, girls. Honest Burgundy is a rarity. Less than one-third of one percent of all the wine produced in France is Burgundy, and of that, a minutest fraction is fine Burgundy. So most people, most Frenchmen, have never tasted an honest bottle of fine Burgundy. Hmm. And much of the Burgundy that comes to this country is fraudulent. Fraudulent. A lot of people, the American who gets involved in wine initially goes to Bordeaux because it's very easy. There are classifications and pick up a book and it tells you all about Chateau Giscour or Lafitte Rothschild. You know what you're buying and you buy it. Mm -hmm. Burgundy's composed of little farmers who make their own wine in their own basement. None of them make enough of it to uh, give to a large distributing firm to distribute. Mm -hmm. Lafitte Rothschild. Well, let's take uh, Chambertin. We've all heard of Chambertin. The whole area of Chambertin consists of 30, I think it's 32 acres, 32.5 acres for the whole world. For everybody in the world who wants Chambertin, they can buy it. All the wine produced from 32.5 acres. Chateau Margaux consists of 600 acres. So how do you compare? 600 acres would would seem to me to be about, a, what, 10 times the size of Disneyland? Yeah, such a yeah. poor judge. Huge. Yeah. But Chateau Lafitte Rothschild makes 50. 15,000 cases of wine a year. 15,000 cases. cases. A great, great grower of Chambertin, if he's lucky, he might make 200 cases. Huh. In many cases, the growers in Burgundy don't have the facilities to bottle their own wine. Chambertin consists of 32.5 acres. Within that area, not one man owns it all. There might be 10 farmers in little plots, and if you visit the area, there are no fences and no boundaries. Uh, he'll walk out in the field and say, well, my vineyard ends here and my neighbor starts here. And if you look, you might see it's cultivated differently. The weeds are picked differently, but that's all. <laughs> and every man who makes Chambertin has his own style of making wine. One may wait a little later to pick or leave the wine uh, in the wood a little longer or bottle a little later. Every piece of soil has a slightly different exposure to sun. It receives rainfall at a different angle. Mm -hmm. The drainage might be a little different. So. Here there are these, say, 10 men who share 32.5 acres of land. The land is all Chambertin. It all has that unmistakable Chambertin taste, yet each one makes a different wine that tastes differently because of their style, of their personality. It's like taking the L.A. Philharmonic and having two orchestra leaders <laughs> conducting it. Same work, uh, it'll sound a little different. Or a, a racehorse with a two trainers, it'll run a little different. Or give me shelter done by the stones of Montavani. Yes. Right. So, I think they offer you more taste sensations that any wine's made because of this. Oh, let's taste some. Okay. Now, the area that produces fine Burgundy, we're talking just fine Burgundy now, is called the Golden Slope. Uh, the Cote d'Or. The Slope of Gold is what the French call it. The Slope and of Gold. Slope of Gold. And it runs maybe 40 miles in length and uh, 100 or 200 yards wide. In this one area, all of the fine Burgundy in the world is produced. One grape is used only. I'm talking about red wines now. Mm -hmm. Pinot Noir. Pinot, Pinot Noir, Noir is grown probably in every country that makes wine, but nowhere does it do as well as it does in this little 30-mile stretch of narrow land. Now, all Burgundy is made with this grape, and yet Chambertin <coughs> tastes different than Musigny, which tastes different than Romani Conti. Again, uh, up there may be two miles apart. That's slightly different exposure to the sun, the different drainage. Uh, the angle at which the rain hits it, and then the, the, the art at which the winemaker treats his and grapes. The, and, and the karma of the farmer. Right. Now, same grape, making all of these wines, and they all taste differently. Uh, why, why did you uh, uh, serve me this one in a heavier glass? Was there any reason? It's a traditional burgundy glass. It's shorter. It is more bulbous. It's wider. Right. Not quite as tall with a wider mouth. Ah. All these glasses were traditional. That is a traditional which isn't necessary, by the way. I don't do this at home normally for my own drinking. I have what I, I call a traditional wine glass, and I serve that for everything, unless we're having something special. If you go to a fine restaurant in France and you order a bottle of wine, they give the same wine glass to everybody. If you order something special in the way of wine, they'll bring you a glass 
depending on the type of wine, similar to what I brought tonight. I brought the exaggerated glasses. To make the blind. Right. Let me sniff this wine. Swirl it first. Swirl. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Kind of oxidizing it. Now I'll sniff it. Now, uh, do you smell violets? Because I do. You know, I do. Initially, no, but when you said violets, now I do. Now, some people say this wine would, would have the scent of truffles. Truffles. But uh, I detect violets. It would be strange for somebody to develop a wine-sniffing habit. Now, yes. take the glass with the Chateau de Scour. The, Ch and the Chateau de Scour. Oh, I haven't... Uh, I haven't oh, taste, taste that. that. Oh. Oh, that's beautiful. That's delicious. This vineyard was once owned by Charlemagne. Charlemagne. Winemaking in this part of France goes back 2,500 years, and many of these vineyards are still surrounded by original Roman walls. This is the most, probably the most delicious wine I've ever tasted in my life. It's made by a farmer by the name of Chandon de Brayer, and I'll tell you how you can somewhat get an idea of authenticity. As I said before, most Burgundy, or not most, but many of the Burgundies that come to this country are fraudulent. Small grower does not have the money to do his own bottling, so he sells his wine in the barrel to a large shipping firm. And they may have this barrel, which contains 50 cases of Chambertin. And some wine merchant in Los Angeles will call him and say, I want 100 cases of so-and-so Chambertin. And he thinks to himself, I only have 50, and this man wants 100, and it's $100 a case. I'll add a little bit of this to it, a little bit of that to it, and I'll make my 50 cases into 100. This is done. And the wine will be shipped, Chambertin, nothing more on it, and a vintage year to this country, and somebody will buy it. It's a 1964 vintage, Corton Bressand, Misa Domaine. This is, I'm going to tell you what that is in a second. Domaine Chandon de Brayer. There's none of this for sale anywhere in the world that I know of. This is from my own cellar, from my own drinking. Any given time, any Bordeaux wine you want, I can get for you. Somewhere in the world, there'll be somebody that has it, and for the right price, they'll sell it. So much is made. Wine connections. Burgundies disappear off the market within a year or two after they are released. Uh, Belgium alone would take the complete output of Burgundy. Switzerland and Belgium are the, are Belgium are the biggest users of Burgundy. Switzerland and Belgium. Belgium. They will take all of it. We get what we can. Uh, this wine, I don't know where in the world you could get it. And you can't buy any old Burgundy commercially. I bet it takes more of it while it's available. Drinking a great bottle of wine, and this is a great bottle, is an experience. Yes. There's no doubt about that. Y you asked me to take a sip of something else. I want you to, to hold the glass, the tall glass, with the other red wine that you score, swirl right. it, swirl put it. Uh, the burgundy glass in your other hand. Good heavens. Swirl it. Don't spill any. And now, see, let me do that with you. And we're going to see if we can smell this in itself just is by an the bouquet event. alone. Be able to tell a Burgundy from a Bordeaux. Now, the Bordeaux, since it's younger and a different type of a grape, which requires a long time to release all of its capabilities, doesn't quite have the bouquet that the Burgundy has. It did. You thought it did when you had it first, oh, but now there's no match but that's right. the bouquet of the Burgundy. The burgundy has a sweeter smell to it. It has a sweeter smell, and it the smell seems to go higher up in my nose. Mm -hmm. Roy is now drinking the burgundy. I'll do the same. It's very difficult to describe taste. Uh, if I asked you to tell me what a banana tastes like, I don't know what you'd say. So, Something I think it's obvious apple. when you just do these two side by side and catch the beautiful perfume that does come up from them. And I think you can now tell the difference in perfume alone between a Burgundy and a Bordeaux. I can. Yeah, it's, uh, it's obvious. It's like night and day. It's difficult by recall. If I gave you one wine and then the other tomorrow, well, I, you would have a difficult time in doing that. The level of demarcation would be how high the smell goes up in my nose. Mm -hmm. In other words, I would know that the Burgundy reaches, uh, it seems to go closer to People my People who are uh, involved with wine spend as much time looking at color, and it is important, and catching the beautiful bouquets that do come up from them as they do drinking them. As you drink your, your wine with your eyes and with your nose and, nose and your palate. We only have a few more minutes, Roy, but, but I want you to talk to us for a moment about the romance surrounding wine. I mean, it's obvious when you go to a very fine French restaurant and do the whole number with the uh, wine steward, but at home, for the folks who are listening to us now, perhaps sometimes of limited means, is there a, 
a, a way or a style of serving the wine or uh, uh, when the wine should be served, how slowly one should consume the bottle that would enhance one's uh, pleasure in this area? There have been some very, very fine meals where I drink the bottle rather rapidly. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think you should get as nice a wine glass as you can. Our department stores have beautiful, inexpensive wine glasses. They should be clear, no color. Clear. They should not be etched. Uh -huh. They should have a stem. A long stem. They should be fairly large. I would say try to get one that would hold at least seven or eight ounces. Uh, that one over there that you're drinking, the Jaskur out of, will probably hold 30 ounces. And it looks like a goblet. That's, that's, but that's an exaggerated example. Uh, it should hold at least seven or eight ounces, as thin a glass as you can possibly get. Uh, don't fill them any more than one-third full. Otherwise, you can't catch the bouquet. It'll be just spilled out the top. You, you want to have space between the top of the wine and the top of the glass for the bouquet to gather, and then you can gather it out of the glass yourself. I see. So don't fill it full. You only need one glass. You don't need different kinds of wine glasses for different kinds of wine. Uh, when you find a wine you like, buy it. Because if it's, if it's a natural wine, and we assume it is, you may not see it again. You can't come back and order it and have somebody manufacture it for you next week. We were talking budgets before. Mm -hmm. Put your budget aside. You may not buy wine for, for a year. When you find something you really like, put enough of it aside so you'll have it. It's going to get better, not worse. It's going to improve. Just save it. Put it away and relish it over the years. <laughs> uh, and then start saving again. But don't buy one bottle and say, I'll come back tomorrow. Don't buy cases until you taste. Our uh -huh. tastes are all different. The wine I like, you may not like. If you see a wine that somebody's told you about, even your best friend says, this wine is unbelievable, you've got to buy it. Uh, <laughs> buy a bottle. Don't buy a case. Right. Taste it. You may not like it. If you like it, then buy it. But buy enough of it so that you'll have wine until the next buy comes along. You can save over 50% in your wine purchases by astute buying. Is there a, a special time of day that, that one's appreciation or enhancement of the, of the wine experience is better? To professionals, yes, but this would be the opposite of what most of us would do. A professional only tastes in the morning, and he won't brush his teeth till after he tastes because of the toothpaste and the effect of that on his taste. He won't eat. He gets up early in the morning and tastes, swallows nothing. Uh, on our first buying trip to France, uh, <laughs> I, they poured me in the car at noon. I, I was used. It's very difficult for an American to taste without swallowing because that's where we taste. And a professional taster doesn't swallow. And I couldn't get the hang of it. I didn't want to waste the wine. So I was out of it. But uh, it took a while. So they, they taste only early in the morning, but they might taste 100 or 200 wines and know what they're tasting. I can understand why they don't swallow. No, they, they can't. No. And uh, I uh, diet. I have a weight problem, as do most Americans. Wine I, is heavy in calories. No, it, it isn't. Uh, mm. it, there are a full bottle of wine like that. 24 ounces has 750 calories, which really isn't that much. A couple of Hershey bars. Yeah, it's like a cheeseburger, isn't it? Yeah, a good cheeseburger with mayonnaise. Yeah. So uh, I took off 60 pounds. I keep it off. And I drink wine daily. I don't eat a lot of bread. I don't eat a lot of sweets. But I have uh, well-balanced meals, and uh, they always include wine. And if I'm home for lunch, like today I might have wine for lunch, too. You must have no difficulty having dinner parties. I'm sure when, when somebody picks up their telephone and checks their answering service and, the, and there's a message from, from Roy Caven uh, that there's going to be a small party, there's no hesitation in calling you. But I mean, I can imagine how you must entertain. It must be extraordinary. We enjoy entertaining. We haven't done as much of it because it's just too much work. Uh, if I am going to cook a dinner party, I take off two days to prepare. To prepare and I work till midnight from 8 o'clock in the morning to midnight cooking for two full, sometimes three full days. And that's with my wife helping and... Uh, maybe we have somebody else helping, too. Even my kids have to pitch in and help there. can imagine the following morning cleaning up the empty glasses. That is a chore. <laughs> this has been a delight for me, really. I appreciate you coming down and, and letting us sample your fine wines. Is there anything else that, that you wanted to say that we haven't One thing hit? I think uh, I never got to. On the estate, I, I think I scared people off Burgundies. Look for the words Mise a Domain on the wine label. It's on this label here. See it right there. Mise that means domain. that the grower bottled his wine. It's no guarantee of quality, but it's a guarantee of authenticity, and the people that do that and put their names on the bottle will not adulter their wines. If it says Chambertin, you can be pretty much assured that it is Chambertin. So look for the words Mise Domain. It is important. My guest has been Roy Caven.